Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. On today's 152nd episode of The Thriller Zone, we launch October with not a world-famous thriller fiction author, but the vice president of the world-renowned literary agency of Trident Media Group, Mark Gottlieb. Mark is a highly ranked literary agent representing numerous New York Times bestselling and award-winning authors. And today's podcast promises to inform and enlighten anyone who is interested in pursuing a career in the ever-expanding world of literature. I'm David Temple, your host. It's time to get into the Thriller Zone. And a great big hearty welcome to Mark Gottlieb right here on the Thriller Zone. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I've followed your show before. You've had some great you know, guest speakers on the show. And um, thank you for what you do for the mystery and um, you know, crime thriller writer community. Well, it, uh, thank, thank you for saying that. It is uh, born out of passion. Uh, I do, uh, I, I both read and write thrillers myself and I just, you know, I'm just basically using my, uh, very first career as the, uh, jumping off point to do what I love. And that's talk to people like yourself. Now, generally we talk about books, by the way, folks, Mark is with Trident Media Group, probably one of the premier publishing talent agencies in the world since the beginning of time. I think, is that what you said? To- I think that's putting it lightly. <laughs> So, you know, every once in a while, I like to mix it up and I like to have people on the show that aren't necessarily writers, but will serve the writers in a way to learn about the business. And I think uh, having watched your career from afar for some time, um, I know that you're a great go to resource and I'm just so glad you're here today. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I uh, yeah, I do kind of, uh, I guess, in a similar fashion to the show, although I'm not, maybe not as tech savvy as yourself. In fact, I think you might have like a, if you're not already recording audiobooks, you should be, you, you sound like a great audiobook uh, narrator. Um, but yeah, I like to, uh, yeah, I, ha- I maintain a blog to help writers, um, just giving them information about the publishing industry and stuff like that. In addition to, you know, just working with the, the books, you know, that we usually represent, um, so yeah, it's uh, I view it all holistically, and um, I can't believe I missed you at the uh, at BoucherCon though. How did that <laughs> happen? I mean, you were probably traveling with a big entourage, right? I mean, just you know, press people and security guards. <laughs> That'd be cool. Well, no, it, you know, I believe it or not, I had never been to a BoucherCon, and the whole thing was that I figured because. Our offices are in New York City. Book publishing, for whatever reason, better or worse, it's situated in New York City. So our offices are right across the street from, you know, Grand Central. Mm -hmm. And Thriller Fest is there every year. So it is quite literally in our backyard. So, you know, I would be too lazy to go to to BoucherCon. I would figure, well, it's just going to, all of that's just going to come to me here in New York, you know. It's how us New Yorkers think, you know. We live on an island, so. But, um I thought I should really check it out because one of my colleagues goes every year and San Diego's a cool city. And so it was fun. Well, dang it. If I had known that I would have <laughs> gone out of my way to hook up and meet you and, and talk because it was a, a great opportunity. Uh, you may have seen, I got to sit down with some of the folks over at Atrium Mystery Bus 
And David Brown, those guys uh, hooked me up to sit down and talk to a few of them. And of course, just seeing a lot of the authors that I correspond with uh, on a daily and weekly basis, it's cool (laughs) for me to sit down and have a beer with or chat over coffee. Oh yeah, finally get to attach a name to a face and you got that, you got a really great like restaurant and bar scene over there too. It's all built right around the convention center. So it's perfect. Yeah. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, I want to, I want to get warmed up a little bit. Uh, I know that we've got a, you know, you're in New York, you're at the top of the spear, you're in the center of the universe. So we're going to move real quickly so that you can get back to all the things that you. Okay. (laughs) I do want to say, how has, you know, what's, what's been, let's do this. What's been a, a professional highlight of the summer thus far, besides going to BoucherCon? What's just been something that you went, wow, this is one thing that's happened this year so far that was like practically blew my mind. Well, I have a uh, something of a mystery book uh, with, although I, w- I don't know if it's squarely within the mystery genre, but um, there's this professor, John A. McDermott, who runs the uh, creative writing program at Stephen F. Austin uh, State, and he wrote a debut novel. We sold it to, you mentioned Atria, we sold it to Peter Borland at Atria. He, Peter only publishes 12 books a year, and they're usually from really established best-selling authors like Janet Ivanovich, and he, he's uh, Frederick Bachman's uh, publisher who wrote A Man Called Uwe, and he bought the book, and it was uh, announced in Publishers Weekly magazine. They only, you know, run six book deals a week, and this was one of them. Um, and it's a really cool premise for a book. I've never heard any premise quite like it. Um, basically, Alfred Hitchcock, in commemorating his show, uh, uh, his movie uh, 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 Psycho, um, he, this is a true story, Time Magazine, I think there was an article about it, they covered the event. Um, he rented an old Victorian mansion on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. The building is still there. You can visit it, although someone's living there. So, you know, yeah. um, knock, and, knock, I'm coming in. Right. Yeah. But he, they um, they uh, he hired professional actors to play ghosts at this party. And the thing that surprises people this one evening is that they're real ghosts who show up at the party. And it's hard to discern, you know, between the two. And all these ghosts have sort of unfinished business and so you get to be a fly on the wall at alfred hitchcock's party you know people in his orbit like grace kelly and folks like that so it's kind of a unique premise for a book wow that is fresh (laughs) wow well good good on you for uh landing that deal right yeah yeah we're excited for it i think we're going to feature it at the frankfurt book fair in germany so we'll try and get some translations of the book sold and uh see what you know, could, could happen in the book to film and TV space. I think there's some excitement there too, for the project. All right. Well, there's, those are, you've just brought up two points that I'm going to get to here a little bit later in the show, but I want to think about this. You represent and correct me if I'm wrong, but I did a little count on you. It looks like you rep about 91 authors. Is that right? Am I close? Uh, me personally, or. Yeah, I think I saw this under your category. Was that, was that close? Me. Um, I'm not sure where, where you're looking for our website, website or yeah. maybe publisher's marketplace, but I, I have at any given point probably working with a, a, a few dozen or so clients. I've done over 270 some odd book deals, but maybe it's showing that's the number of authors pertaining to those book deals. That might be what you're looking at on the publisher's marketplace. Um, the agency as a whole, though, I mean, there are probably thousands of clients here uh, and a lot of them big bestsellers. Yeah. All right. Well, th- to that point, I, I asked myself, how do you manage to keep so many people happy? You're going to notice right now, I do a two part question all the time. So how do you keep them all happy? And and how long is a standard work day for you? I mean, last time I checked, I only have 24 hours. I don't know how many you have, but uh, it's kind of like that movie, Man in the Iron Mask. There's another one of me so hiding somewhere out there. I don't know. But I don't know the thing with that, that many authors is some authors will write one book their entire life. You know, some will write a book every year if they're really prolific. I mean, I think a good pace for commercial fiction is publishing a book every 12 to 18 months. Kind of the readership tends to expect that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got clients who they'll publish a book every 10 years. And when they do, it's like it's an event, you know. So they're all going to be at different stages in their careers is my point. Yeah. And so 
And so the second part of the question is, you know, how long is a standard work day? You must, I have to believe, and I know New Yorkers in general, because I used to li- I lived there twice. Your day starts early, and I know it goes late. Uh, well, it does start early in a, a lot of cases, uh, especially if you're an insomniac. <laughs> but uh, no, I, um, well, we usually, I think our office hours are actually 9.30 to 6. A lot of people do get here early and they stay late. The work continues on into the evening. You know, I can't really sit at my desk and read manuscripts. There's too many distractions. The phone is ringing. People are running in here to ask questions, things like that. So we do a lot of the reading at home, at night, evenings, weekends, along the commute, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, being, you know, ever since I would say the, ever since COVID and thing, when things went like partially remote, now we're three days in the office, two days from home which is nice. It's conducive to reading and editing, stuff like that. Um, and uh, technology, you know, being in the palm of your hand, a little cell phone like that, um, you know, you're, most of the emails, before I even get into the office, I've, I've put out most of the fires before nine in the morning. So, you know, that's usually good. Um, but we do shift our hours around like that because we like to stay later than just being nine to five because um, we try to match up with Hollywood with the West coast or pitching books for film and TV. That's part of the reason. And then the, um, my colleagues who work in foreign rights, they shift their time zones around a little bit too, because they're dealing with publishers in other countries, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia, you know, so they try to, they are, are, have probably have odd hours too. So to go back to that question that popped into my head a, a minute ago was, um, Besides repping numerous New York Times bestselling authors, uh, you also work with selling and optioning books for TV and film. That's right. I I know a little bit about that. I got a pretty good idea. But for my audience who may not know how that procedure works, tell tell us, walk us through that procedure, Mark. Something you find a book is spectacular and you're like, ooh, uh, someone wants Hollywood wants to option it. First of all, how does the option buy process work? Uh, okay. Let's use the example of the book I just gave. Um, you know, we ran a book deal announcement for the author, both in Publishers Marketplace and Publishers Weekly magazine. The film and TV industry, they watch that stuff. You know, they read the book deals and sometimes they might reach out and say, hey, we're a studio or we're looking for this actor or this director. And this project sounds really interesting to us. Are the film and TV rights available? And we'll either say yes or no. And when the manuscript's ready, We'll send it to them, you know, for them to review. And, you know, you could end up with a few different scenarios, like a couple of which you mentioned. Um, You know, one scenario, ideal scenario would be um, the film or TV company, the studio wants to option it, which basically means kind of like they're they're hoping for a golden goose. They they put uh, maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars. The option payments aren't always huge. Um, but it's to have about a year or so to put the project together. So to get, get a showrunner, to get, you know, get the producer, to get the director, the actors involved, put a writer on it, put it all together for the studio. Um, and that can take a while to put the project together like that. So they, they're basically by themselves exclusivity and time uh, in having a film and TV option on a book. Um, or... The studio, and this has happened in the case with another client of mine who actually, she writes thrillers. She's a New York Times bestselling author. Um, Sony uh, Studios bought the book outright. So they just, they own it like in perpetuity. You know, they purchased it. It's called a purchase instead of an option. So that in that kind of instance, probably you're looking at at least, I mean, we've done purchases and, you know, for millions of dollars, but, you know, you're looking probably, you could be looking in the six figures you know, for a purchase and basically the studio owns it and then they can do what they want with it. Um, not like a book though, with the term of copyright or, or something or a license. I mean, they kind of just own it for almost indefinitely. All right. I want to go back to one thing. I want to make sure that I heard the word nice product placement right there, TMG. Um, I want to know, did you say uh, usually are or aren't the are aren't kind of disappeared on the option? You said they are usually a good, a high price or aren't you? Oh, the options. So the option fees, you know, they're usually, 
you know, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, okay, you're rarely you. talking six figures or million dollar purchases for, for someone to option a, a book for film or TV. So it isn't huge money, but it, um, some projects get, you know, nicely sustained that way. For instance, we have clients who they get an option renewed year over year over year by a studio that wants to continue to sit on a project. And the, the estate or the author, you know, is happy to continue to collect the option fees if they want to sit on it. They're, at least they're paying money to do so. Now, let me ask you a question. This is interesting. It just popped into my head. So let's say, for instance, uh, I have a book. Somebody wants to option it. You do the deal and we'll call it ten thousand dollars. And a year passes and they and the option has lapsed uh-huh. and they come back and they go, hey, I want to do it again. I'm like, yeah, OK, say we do a little bit more. Twenty thousand. I'm making these numbers up. All right. Then what happens is halfway through that, somebody else in Hollywood goes, ooh, I really want it. I want it bad. I'm stuck with that second year option, aren't I? I can't, I can't jump out of that option. Is that true or not? So yes, you're talking about an instance where maybe the first option period lapses. So a year has gone by and the studio at that point can choose to renew or not renew the option. If they renew it, they usually pay another fee to continue to add more months, like whether it be six more months or a year or whatever. We usually try to get them to pay more money to, you know, the longer they sit on a project or we ask for less time, one of the two. Um, But what you're talking about is an instance where now an option period has renewed and another company that looks very interesting, very appealing comes along and you want to see the project situated with them, but it's already kind of, it's under option with another company. Kind of, They're sitting on the egg. Um, Sometimes what you can do, and we've done this in a couple of instances, you can make a marriage between the two companies. You know, you get them to co-produce or get them both on the project if they're willing to do that. Uh, We did that, you know, in one instance, there was a very well-known actor, director, producer. He has a I don't I'm trying to respect people's privacy. But so he has um, a bunch of shows and movies. Probably you you have seen he's won a ton of awards. He kind of came out of the woodwork after something was already under option with another company, a production company. And we really, really wanted his involvement on the project because he's a huge name. And so we, you know, we introduced the two companies and got them working together. Nice. So everybody wins. Yeah. When that can happen. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, To switch gears just a little bit, your background obviously plays a role in uh, your successful career. And what was the one of the uh, meaning of your education? Because you have a rather handsome education. What was one of of your biggest takeaways there while attending Emerson College um, where you studied literature and publishing? What, what, What in those formative years made you go, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I'm built to do? And, you know, what was what was that? biggest takeaway from that time the funny thing is it did that did not really happen for me until maybe my junior or senior year of college um when i was first looking at schools uh a lot of my we went to a very uh well-known school growing up and a lot of my friends went to ivy league schools and things like that and i thought to myself well i can go to columbia or i can go to cornell i can study comparative literature you know, but what would that tell me about working in book publishing? And, you know, I knew I wanted to make my way toward book publishing in large part because um, both my parents worked in publishing and it's actually my family business where I work. We own and operate the company. So I knew I wanted to work in publishing, but there weren't a lot of schools offering an undergraduate study in book publishing. But Emerson College was one of them. And it was only the second year they created that program at the, the school. So it, it was still fresh and new. And when I got there, I was all excited. And then I realized they didn't have a whole lot of publishing classes. What they had instead was mostly literature, creative writing classes, and the occasional publishing class. Who could they get to come in and teach a publishing course except uh, professional like editors, people work in publishing in the Boston area where the school was based. So my book marketing professor, you know, worked at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt doing their marketing, you know, stuff like that. Um, and as the years went on in the school, they were at, would add in more courses. We formed a publishing club. We started a small press to help the school build out the curriculum and its understanding of publishing. 
and the, the club is still there. The publication we created is still there. Um, and it was a good entree into book publishing rather than simply stumbling out of the humanities and then trying to make sense of, a, of a, the book business. That's awesome. So you kind of you kind of made your own way to borrow a phrase in in a certain sense. Oh. We, for instance, you know, because we weren't getting the publishing classes that we wanted. You know, we would bring in like a local author. There's a thriller author we actually represent here. Um, he's a New York Times bestselling author named uh, William Martin. Or I know him as Bill Martin. He writes historical thrillers kind of like in the uh, that national treasure, that kind of school of sure. or Clyde Cussler, that kind of thing. Um, and he was local to Boston. And so we would have him in uh, to come and speak. And sometimes in the club, we would make like, you know, curriculum for ourselves and occasionally I would be sitting in like a book editing class and find a sheet that we had made for our, our publishing course. And I, I would call the professor out on it in front of the, the, the other students and the professor, you know, he would say something like, well, you know, it's an academic community. We, we share this kind of information. I said, that's fine, but you can, you can give some credit for that, you know, at the top of the, the handout or whatever you're using, you know? Yeah. That's great. Now, talking about being busy, which uh, it seems that your life is full of, you've lect you've lectured on both writing and publishing. Let's see. Uh, let's rattle off a few small schools. Or hardly anybody knows about them. Yale, Cambridge, Columbia, Emerson. And I read where in your free time, now this, this knocks me out, folks. In your free time, do you still tutor English uh, language classes to adults from underprivileged uh, immigrant families? So yeah, they, these are like a few of the different things I do, but yeah, basically, um, as a part of, of, I feel like it's a part of my job to give back, you know, you can't just t continually take from the well and not give back. So, um, I go to a lot of conferences, events, schools, and things like that. And I speak about publishing, you know, at libraries and things like that, um, to kind of teach people about the book world and, uh, to help you know, hopeful writers become published authors, basically. And then as a part of that, when I moved up to Stanford, Connecticut during the pandemic, and, you know, a lot of us had more free time on our hands, you know, suddenly we didn't have a commute and all this. I thought, well, how can I give back to the community? And I reached out to an organization called Family Centers, which is a big multinational organization. They provide a lot of health and human services, uh, medical to and education to, you know, low, basically mostly low income immigrant families, um, things like that. And I said, how I said, here's what I do, you know, um, how can I best help you all? And they said, well, we need someone to tutor for English classes. And so I did that for, you know, a semester or two there. And, you know, they're always in need, um, you know, if people have skills or, or anything that, they want to help with or, or give back to them. I'm sure they, they would love for it. But yeah, basically these are, these are mostly adults who, you know, they've come over here. They're, they're learning English for the first time. And at the same time, they're working and raising families. So, you know, think about how difficult it is to learn a language, especially in the midst of um, coming to a new country and, and, and all those other complications. So that's why I, I uh, thought to do that. Um, and then I, I used to run a, uh, like a small literary salon, not like a hair salon, <laughs> but like in the olden days when, uh, you know, intellectuals used to gather and talk philosophy and big ideas and things like that. So mm -hmm. I used to run a literature, arts and culture salon in Stamford, um, at our local brewery and we'd host, you know, authors and artists and poets, et cetera, to come and speak, um, and so one of our big speakers was uh, uh, a man by the name of Abdul Tubman, which is, he's actually a relative of Harriet Tubman's. And so he came and spoke at the event and the local paper showed up with a photographer and all that. It was, it was pretty neat. This is amazing. This shows, this, this tells me a whole lot about you and, and what you're made of and what you're about. And uh, I find that both fascinating and heartwarming. It does beg this question. And this was, this kept going through my mind when I was reading about you. I'm like, okay, he's over here doing this and he's doing that. And he's doing, that. I mean, what, what does Mark do with his spare time? Now I know you love to, there's travel. no spare time. <laughs> That's the short answer. Yeah. None, right? Well, I think for me, 
publishing, it's more than a job or a lifestyle or a career or any of that. It's an extension of me. It's just another part of me. It's who I am. And um, I, I, en I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I think it makes life interesting. And it's nice when, when, it, when work is like that in your life. It doesn't feel like work anymore. It feels like you're doing, you're just living life. And, um, and it's all kind of, kind of works out. It comes together in a way. Yeah. You just stole the thought that was going through my mind at that exact second. If you <laughs> do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look how prolific, I guess, I don't know. Picasso was really prolific. He must've been doing what he loved. I mean, to make that much artwork, you know? Um, so there are, you know, people who just enjoy what they do and, it looks like they do too much of it, but they're they're enjoying themselves. Yeah, but I tell I tell you what, that is a great lesson in life, if you ask me. I mean, I do this because I love it. You do that because you love it, and I think the quality will rise to the occasion of to meet the passion with which you approach something. So if you uh, are, if you're going through the motions or you're half assing it, you're gonna it's gonna show. But if you really love it, like you do and like I do. Uh, hopefully that shows, and I think it does for both of us. So kudos oh, yeah. to us. Boom, boom. Hey, yeah. <laughs> now let's talk about uh, – I'd like to talk about the business side of things. Uh, sure. I'd love to know a couple of uh, – let's call them best practices. So let's say, for instance, I'm looking for an agent, which is actually <laughs> all kind of true. Uh, did I say hey. that out loud? But, like, what is the – what's the best practice for someone in my in – my, in the position of my listeners that uh, we want to find an agent. We want to do it the right way. We want, we don't look like an idiot. Tell me what that looks like. Well, I think for a lot of writers starting out, it's, it always, the equation to them is always, I've written a book. Now I go and get an agent because that's my way into book publishing. And that's how I go on to, you know, have a successful career. Uh, but I think before doing that, it's always worth kind of, sort of pausing, take a, take a beat and say, you know, and look at like, look at the manuscript one more time. Um, and then say to you, like, for instance, I mean, you go to BoucherCon, right? Um, or, or I imagine you've been to Thriller Fest or sim, some similar such events. A lot of writers will go to workshops and conferences, things like that, to build out their network, to get people to like endorse their books, um, to really understand the craft, storytelling, all of that. And to just hone their writing um, and build a, a background um, in, in writing, like different writing credentials and things like that. Then they'll begin the, I think from there, when they feel like the manuscript is really ready to go, it's melded nicely to the needs of the marketplace and that the writer has all these uh, great feathers in their cap. I think then they go out and begin to approach agents. Um, probably they use, I would say there's a ton of information online. There's a ton of misinformation online. I think the simplest thing to do, you know, if there were a magic bullet, um, there's a website called Publishers Marketplace, which is basically like the online Rolodex of book publishing. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to search agents, see the kinds of deals they're doing, uh, you know, what if they're strong in a certain category, something like that, and then to reach out to them from there because um, all their contact details are there. Yeah, that's no. a good way for them to start. Superb, superb insight. I am familiar with that. By the way, conversely, what could you say would be the biggest mistake? Um, uh, well, <laughs> you have a, you have a look of uh, recognition there, like, oh, I've I've got I've that seen, covered, David. Definitely. Well, there are so many. I usually say <laughs> there's so many things you can do wrong that it's almost easier to just focus on the things you can do right. You know, right. so. But, um, I, you know, sometimes writers will come to me with an idea and be like, ah, this is my book idea. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. Send it to me. And they're like, well, I haven't written it yet. I was just seeing if you'd be interested. And now I feel compelled to write it, you know. So that's that doesn't help anyone, really. Um, you know, I think uh, that would definitely be a big mistake or along those lines, not writing a book which is way too long or way too short. Right. That kind right. Of Okay, how about this? What what is uh, let's do this. I'd love to know one of your favorite aspects of your job. Going back to that I'm living my passion. So what's that thing that 
I always use the phrase that makes me tick. What's that thing that gets you out of bed and you're like, man, I can't wait to get to the office to do blank. Well, I remember a distinct moment. I was at the, so I go every year to like the, the Yale writers workshop. And um, one of my clients, I think his, you can't see it on the shelf. It's behind me, but his book, Spindle City, Jotham Borello is his name. It was up for like the pen award or something. It was his debut novel. I, I helped him sell it. And, um, he owns a flower farm in, in rural Connecticut, and he invited me and my, my wife up to help him. Um, we were planting flower bulbs. He sells flowers at the farmer's market. He has a farm there, not just teaching like creative writing. Uh, um, but anyway, um, I said to him, Jotham, how do you feel about your debut novel? Like, are you happy? You know, the book's published and everything. And he said, are you kidding me? When, when people ask me, how much this book sold for? I tell them it sold for $10 million. And I said, Jotham, why are you telling people that? That is not true. You made that up. This book did not sell for $10 million. And he said, yeah, but that's the thing. That's what this was worth to me. He said, he said, you know, I work at a university. I, after this book deal, this book came out, I got, I became a tenured professor. They put my family on my medical and dental um, I got, so I got a promotion. I'm running the English department at the school now. Um, he said, that's what this publication was worth to me. And when he said that, it kind of put things in, into perspective because you are kind of, uh, in my job, you're like a conduit for people's dreams in a way. Like you, yeah. you help them realize that stuff. And I was just really happy for him. I was so glad that he felt that way. I want to take a second on that because that's so neat. I mean, you are the conduit for people's dreams. And when you put it that way, it just like hit me. And that has got to give you such a remarkable feeling of satisfaction that, I mean, it's one thing, you know, you close a deal. Yeah. And you get a nice little chunk of it, whatever. But the fact that you're making a dream come true for somebody who has spent hours, weeks, months, years toiling on this story that they were afraid no one would believe in, but you did and you take it and you nurture it and you sell it. I mean, tell it's me like being, that. being the Sandman, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you live a little bit vicariously, you know, it's like, remember in the movie Greece when they're like, tell me more, tell me more, you know, you're, you're, they, they were all a little bit vicarious about their summer romance. Well, you know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm vicarious about like just authors and them realizing their dreams. I think it's pretty cool when that happens, even though it's not like my dream necessarily per se, it's just nice when someone else is that happens for them, you know? Yeah. Has anyone ever asked you what the most important talent in being, and I think they call you super agent, Mark. Um, <laughs> at least they said that at the front desk. So what, what is that most important talent, do you think? In keeping with, I mean, you're making dreams come true, but I mean, is there one more talent more important than another? Well, you do need to know material. You know, you need to be able to read something and say, this is going to work or this won't work in the, in the current marketplace. And, you know, sometimes you read a book and it's great storytelling and it's really fun, but it's so far outside the norm that it wouldn't, it wouldn't really connect the negotiation skills, obviously, because, you know, sometimes you get multiple offers from a publisher, you have to navigate that. Um, and so there, there are different, there are different aspects to it. It's creative, but it's also kind of business minded too, in a way. Mark, I get to, uh, I get the unique honor of being able to read a lot of books in a given week and actually to a point of almost, uh, a challenge when it comes to my own personal writing and free time. But, uh, as you were telling that, and I'm completely on board with you, I thought to myself, a couple of books have come along recently and they've done a number of different things. You've got your standard straight ahead thriller, commercial thriller that you're like, oh yeah, you're reading it and the pages are turning. You're like, yeah, 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 I got this. It fits into a perfect little category. Mm -hmm. Then I've run across books that I'm reading. This thing is kind of crap. And it's just, and you're like, oh, it's, it's crap. And I'm not sure. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, right. And then, you know, that category, mm -hmm. then you have the surprises of where you're going. I'm not really sure the big, and then you get into it and they pull you in and they suck you in and then you're off to the races and you're like, man, I'm glad I waited 
until part of that second act, if I'll give it that much time, because bam. Hmm. And go ahead. I was going to say, is that's like a slow burn thriller or something they call them sometimes, or a slow burn mystery, something like that. And if you didn't know it, you'd give up on it. Or if you didn't have the patience, you'd give up on it. And I, But a couple of times I'm like, I'm going to give it one more chapter. And I, I always respect it because I know how much time it takes to put into it. But I always find myself going, man, it, it always falls into about one of three categories. Anyway, let me move on to this because you mentioned something a minute ago uh, about a Frankfurt fair because you have there's a fair that you were uh, at recently. Oh, in Germany, the Frankfurt book fair. Yep. Right. But you were at one. I saw uh, I was stalking you. I mean, doing homework for your uh, we're looking on your Instagram account and you were in London. We did go to the London Book Fair and um, we go there every year, you know, to pitch uh, editors, uh, mostly UK editors, but some foreign publishers to get our books translated and published overseas. Same, same thing in, in Germany, which we're getting ready for. It's in, this October. It's like less than a month away. Oh, wow. Well, the reason I brought that up is I've always wanted to attend the London Book Fair for some reason. Well, first of all, I've yeah, never been to London. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I've, I've never been to London. I've always wanted to go. My wife and I were talking the other day. I'm like, babe, let's go to London for crying out loud. I mean, we watch all London based television show, British shows. So and I think the Thriller Zone, I, I really like to have the Thriller Zone show up there next year. So maybe oh, yeah. film an yeah. episode there. That'd be cool. Exactly. You're reading my mind. So I'm going to talk to you offline about uh, let's talk about some things because I would love, especially if I know you're going to be there, you can give me a little firsthand uh, clue on how to get in and around that whole space. But I think it would be very cool to my listeners. Would Don't you? Oh, it'd be so neat because you'd be right there like on the showroom floor with everything. And like you'd have access to all these great writers and publishers who, who are there. And they host the event in the Olympia Center, which was built by Queen Victoria. It was an old train station, and it's still this kind of old wrought iron and glass. Um, one year I was there, there, somehow pigeons managed to get into the building. You see them flying around. And there's a guy who works there who has the coolest job in the world. He's like, it's such a British thing. He has a falcon, and his the falcon goes and catches these pigeons and brings them back to him. And I thought, okay, that's a little bit gruesome, but at the same yeah. time, that's pretty cool. It's kind of medieval. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes you see the falcon flying around catching these pigeons. Wow. That is definitely something you don't see every day. <laughs> the British have a certain way of doing things, you know. Yeah. I love that. Well, listen. I, I I don't I want to be respectful of your time and I want to move away uh, and get going. There's a last personal question, and sure. I love to know this for some particular reason. Uh, first of all, I never asked you. You, you work with your dad. Your yes. dad still runs a joint, right? Yes, he's still here. He's uh, you know busy as as always. I think he's the kind of guy who you know he can't he's he can't do anything else. He's yeah. got to be busy the same way I am. He gets extremely restless, so. But yeah, he's a very big name in, in mystery, crime, thrillers. He's worked with a lot of uh, authors like Dean Koons and Tom Clancy and, and others in the kind of Janet Ivanovich among them. So and he still has a lot of big thriller authors uh, here. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it can be interesting working with your parents. It's not the easiest thing. Uh, there's certain challenges, you know, because they're, like, they're, they're willing to speak to you one way. And another way to sometimes the other employees, so yeah. it can they well, can be harsh and you know kind in other ways. <laughs> well, I'm jealous. I I my very first job, I think I was 15 years old. I got to work with my dad, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever because I, I you know I'd never got enough time with him. But so uh, when I was reading this and I found out that Pops runs the head office, I was like, man, that's got to be pretty cool. And it's got to be a fine line between, well, uh, Mark, I need you to do so and so. Son, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, no, we, um, it, it can make for an interesting relationship, but it's made for also really good learning experience too, because for instance, when his assistant left abruptly and went to work for a competitor, he gave her two weeks, you know, severance or whatever, but wanted her gone the same day. He didn't want her taking, you know, company uh, information to a competitor. So I didn't have any time to train. He just said, hey, you're going to come and cover my desk for me, right? And I, my immediate answer was no. And he said, that's nice, but you don't have a choice in the matter. And it turned out to be, you know, a really, really good learning experience. Although 
when you're helping someone handle, you know, multi-million dollar book deals, you also can feel very, you know, uh, on edge, <laughs> you know, but it actually was pretty incredible. And you, you got to be kind of at, seated at the, the helm of, of book publishing yeah. um, and working with some of the, the biggest name authors. And so, yeah, it was a great, great learning experience. And I mean, he's a couple offices down the hall from me. So we're here every day together. It's nice. Now, see, Mark, if you know anything about me, uh, I, I like to go out, play outside the sandbox a little bit. If you were on a laptop, I would have you pick up that laptop oh. and we'd go down the hall and we'd like bust in on dad's office and hey, David's on the thriller zone. We want to say yeah. hi. But, oh, well, if I, if I had this on my iPad or phone, we'd do that. Sometime we could. I mean, yeah. His, his business partner, you know, our CEO um, has a lot of photos in his office of different celebrities because that's sort of his speciality. So there are photos of him with like Dick Van Dyke and, you know, Seinfeld and other people. He's helped them with their memoirs. So that's sort of his forte. So, yeah, it's a neat spot to work. There's a lot of creativity in the air, a lot of a lot of beautiful books around. It's kind of cool. Well, maybe we'll circle back around and we'll do that another time. Sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's fair enough. And you know what? I, I think that would be really cool. Uh, let's do this before we go. Uh, with authors, I tend to uh, ask them their best piece of writing advice, but I want to do something more playful with you. Now that I've seen okay. that you're a really super chill, laid back kind of guy I could hang out and have a few cocktails with. There's a little game I play rapid fire questions. I'm only going to do two of them because we got to okay. You got a busy day to go on, but here, here's number one. You've just been given an all expense trip to a remote exotic Island. And I'm playing on the fact that you have very little time off. So that's why I came up with this. So you're going for a long vacation. We'll call it a month. It doesn't matter. What are three things that you cannot go on that vacation without? And I'll be specific. Name me a book that you're going to take with you. You're like, Oh, I got to have this book, a book. A music player now. Back in the old days, and before your before your time, Sean, we call it a CD, but they don't know what CDs are anymore. Mm. Uh, so, a favorite music player of your favorite artist. That's what I'm getting uh, at. And number okay. three, what beverage would you like to have on hand at all times? So, again, one month vacation, three things: a book, a brand of music, a genre, a band, etc., or a be and a beverage. Well, the beverage part's easy. I mean, oh, oh, ice cold beer is always nice. You know, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Um, although if you drink too much beer in a desert island, I don't know. But anyway, I'd bring it. Uh, in terms of a band, um, oh, gosh, there's too many that, that I really like. But uh, maybe this artist Beck, I think oh. he's great. Um, any of it, almost any of his albums, honestly. In terms of a book, I mean, I loved reading An Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. It's still one of my favorite books. Um, you know, I'd love to read that or reread that. So yeah, maybe those would be my three awesome. items. <laughs> awesome. All right. And the last question, number two, my wife, Tammy, and I have invited you for dinner at our home, you and your wife here in Del Mar, just outside of San Diego, as you know, probably just mm -hmm. up the road. And we're going to ask you to bring your wife and two more guests to help round out our swanky evening. Now they can be living or past. So it could be somebody you've always dreamt of being around number two people. Who would they be and why? Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, that is really, really a tough one. I mean, in terms of a living author, I think it actually would be really cool to hang out with Tom Robbins. Yeah. Uh, you know, I already mentioned his book, but I think Ralph Ellison would be great, too. But if we were to have someone other than, you know, an, an author there, a musician, I love jazz music, maybe – It'd be cool to have Miles Davis there. I mean, yeah, <laughs> a lot of good choices. I mean, that's, all these questions are make you a kid into a make you a kid in a candy store. You know, I mean, possibilities are limitless. Uh, I'm good for that. Well, folks, if you'd like to learn more about Mark, go to his website, tridentmediagroup.com. And is it true? I read somewhere on the website, so I want to make sure. Uh, are you actively seeking submissions? Now? That's right. Yeah, we are open for business, so people should feel free to think of us. And if they want to send their query letters and manuscripts, we're happy to take a look and see. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, make some more career authors. That would be great. Mm, you hear that, people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big Daddy here is taking submissions. <laughs>
So, Mark yeah. Kenna, who, thank you so much for spending time with us, man. Oh, uh, this is awesome. This is fun. Thank you. This is great. Your front row seat to the best thriller.